Welcome to Flock Talk, Flock Talk, the podcast where we feature your favorite authors and narrators. Hosted by Craig Hart and Sarah Hannon. Visit us today at pinkflamingoproductions.com. And now, Flock Talk. Hello, all you happy flockers out there. Welcome to Flock Talk. My name is Craig Hart, and I'm here with my fearless co-host, Sarah Hannon. How are things going over your way, Sarah? Uh, good, but I, I do take a little issue with fearless. I have a terrible fear of heights. So uh, as long as I get to sit on the floor, we're good. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm not sure the heights fear counts. That's a common one. So I think oh. I think that's uh, you can get away with that one for sure. All right. Well, I guess as long as I'm wearing my cape, I'm... I can masquerade as fearless. <laughs> now, that's a topic we need to get into later, for sure. <laughs> I want to know all about this. <laughs> well, let's get into today's interview. We have two great guests today, don't we, Sarah? I know. Two for the price of one. We're very lucky today. Um, a former English professor, Janae Sacken, is a photojournalist who travels the world documenting the lives of women and children. She also photographs wildlife and is deeply committed to the conversation of endangered species through enhancement of life for indigenous peoples. She's done her share of adventure travel as well, summiting Mount Kilimanjaro, trekking the Andes, kayaking the South Atlantic, and canoeing the Zambezi River. Her journeys always include visits to schools, whether a boarding school in the Gobi Desert, a two-room building in the desert of southern Madagascar, or a stick hut in Tanzania. She believes that with education comes peace, health, and empowerment. When not traveling, she lives with her husband and three cats in Shorewood, Wisconsin, where she's hard at work on her next novel in the award-winning Annie Hawkins Green series. Speaking of the Annie Hawkins Green series, we have Nicole Swanson, who has recently completed narrating book one of that series and did an amazing job, I might add. That book's called Behind the Lens, book two coming up soon. Nicole is an audiobook narrator with a voice described as having a vivid, silvery tone with a bright and sunny dynamic. Her narration conveys a warmth and charm informed by her southern roots and experience as the mother of three amazing daughters. Nicole's strengths lie in her flexible range, ear for accents, and character development skills. Nicole loves escaping into her home studio to entertain her faithful listener, Black Jack the Studio Dog. Thank you both for joining us. So happy to have you here. Thanks for having us. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you. And can I just say that when I was climbing Kilimanjaro, I do have a fear of heights and edges. And we were scaling up the Western Breach, which is a 2,500 foot scale. And I stepped out into thin air because I have vertigo and I get disoriented. And my husband caught me by one arm and my guide caught me by the other. Oh my <laughs> gosh. <laughs> So I understand fear of... I life. believe my heart stopped for a full minute just then. <laughs> Janae, you're, you're writing novels. Someday, maybe you will write a book about your experiences. Only if Nicole narrates. Oh, oh, absolutely. But you must take me with you on some adventures so that I can get the full experience and then narrate to my best abilities. I think you're living the life I want. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to dive in if we could. I'd like to ask Janae a little bit about your journey to becoming an author. As a former English professor, the written word has clearly always been important to you. But when did you first start thinking you might want to become a novelist? I was in third grade and our regular teacher um, had left. And we had one of our substitutes for the rest of the year. And all of the kids, except her son, who was also in class with us, were terrified of her. And so one of the first days um, that she was our new teacher, she assigned us to write a story. And I just let it all out. I was going to write what I know. So I wrote about a shepherd in a desert. I know nothing about shepherds or <laughs> deserts. And I handed in my paper, which was like 10 pages long. And I noticed everybody else was handing in half a page. And I thought, oh, boy, I've really screwed up. The next day, she called me up to the front of the classroom. And she really was a witch. And <laughs> had me stand there. And she read it to the class. And the entire time, I'm thinking, uh, waiting for the shoe to drop. You know, you're in trouble now. And at the end, she said, boys and girls, we have an author in our classroom. 
And that was what planted the seed for me. Um, and I continued to write when I was in fourth grade. My class voted to stay in from recess to listen to me read um, one of the stories I had written. Wow. Talk about empowering. Yeah. Um, by the time I got to graduate school, there was no time left for creative writing. And then I was a professor, and it was all literary criticism, publish or perish. And um, near the end of my time in academia, my husband and I took a trip to Zimbabwe. And there was a Nyanga there who is a seer and a healer. And he um, threw the bones for me, and then he took my hand and he said, I see you are a teacher, but you're also a writer and you have stories to tell and you need to tell them. And that was on July 10th, 1998. And I said, I, I really need to start thinking about leaving academia and getting um, to what I really want to do, which is photography, photojournalism, and then after that, it was writing a novel. Very good. What does it mean to throw the bones? Um, it depends on where you are, what tribal affiliation you have. Um, this Nyanga um, was from Bulweo, and so he was Endebelli, and for him, um, there were four literal bones. I imagine they were chicken bones and they had been intricately carved. And um, what a healer and seer does is very positive. He tries to, or she tries to, figure out um, what's ailing you. You hold the bones in your hand and um, then you toss them down on the mat in front of you and he may pick them up and toss them again and he studies them and they reveal to him um, what the path forward is. And so I just, I ha didn't have a particular problem. I just said, what am I supposed to do in life? And that was his answer. Very cool. I need to meet that guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, talk about a little bit, let's get into a little bit about the, the book itself, Behind the Lens. Can you tell us, uh, give us a summary of what the book is about? Sure. Seasoned photojournalist Annie Hawkins Green barely survives a Taliban ambush in 2006 that leaves her military escort uh, dead and a feisty young Afghan village girl dying in her arms. She manages to suppress all of that horror for another nine years until she returns to Afghanistan at the request of her best friend and college roommate, Daria Faludi, who has returned herself to Afghanistan to open a school for girls. Annie returns to teach a photography workshop at this school for girls in the very peaceful Panjshir Valley. And once there, the nightmares of her first um, time in country come roaring back. And this is at about the same time that the Taliban are starting to make inroads into the Panjshir Valley. And so Annie is not sure what is real because of PTSD that is starting for her. And things go wrong. Things go wrong as they are wont to do in novels. Yeah, if they don't, you don't have a novel. Exactly. Um, but when did you start first first start thinking about putting out an audiobook version? What brought that to mind? Um, various writer friends said, you're going to do an audio of this, aren't you? And um, I was like, eh, I don't know. Um, yeah, wishful thinking. Um, and then literally, I, I love to go to book groups. And one woman at one book group said, I haven't been able to read your book, and I'm really sorry, but I'm blind. And... She said, is there going to be an audiobook? And on the spur of the moment, I said, oh, yes. And then I realized I knew nothing about audiobook making. And as it happened, the next week, um, Teresa Backen had me on her Desideratum podcast and um, told me about Craig. And um, so I contacted you 
and um, we did an open casting call and I heard I think 10 or 12 different tapes and fell in love with Nicole's tape. When I heard it, I literally, I was alternating between laughing and weeping because I said, that's Annie's voice. <laughs> that is the voice in my head. Oh, what a great compliment. I love it. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's a really special relationship to build. What a blessing that you two have that you found each other. I'm so glad. It truly is. You know, wait till you hear her voice. I mean, Mel just jumps off the page. Mel is the 15-year-old daughter. And I mean, so many of the voices are just, they're exactly what I had in my head. It's uncanny. Annie Hawkins Green has really, its she has come to life for me in incredible new dimensions, thanks to Nicole. Thank you. I love it. It's, it's such a great story, and it's been so much fun and challenging. Tell us a little bit about those challenges. Tell us about what it was like uh, preparing for recording. Well, there's the all the, the usual, you know, preparing and reading and character development. But um, this book, because it's set in Afghanistan, um, there's the whole language element, which was I love languages and I love accents and I love all things learning new new skills like that. And so not only did I have to speak with a uh, Pashtun or Dari accent, but um, I also had to learn some of the language because there are, oh, I think, somewhere between 80 and 100 phrases that are in these different languages that I had to say. There's fantastic and very daunting, but, but in a really great way. I have a friend whose husband is retired military, and he was stationed in Afghanistan and worked with a linguist there. So he hooked me up with his linguist friend, and we spent, you know, an hour, hour and a half going through all the phrases in the book and teaching me how to say it and and me doing a horrible job at the beginning trying to, <laughs> to repeat it back. There are, the words don't look anything like you expect them to sound. Like there are letter combinations in there that we just don't have those sounds in English. So it took a little while and a little bit of practice. I ended up actually um, buying a, a uh, Pashto course from Pimsler, and every day uh, I would listen to 30 minutes in the car and learn the phrases and, and try to learn the language, which made it immensely that much easier. It was an immense help. Now, am I correct in thinking that you two are going to hook up again for book two in the series? Yes. <laughs> yes, we are. I think we've already hooked up on it, haven't we? Yes, I am preparing right now. I'm getting ready to go read some more. <laughs> Could I just add something? Um, I think Nicole is being a little modest. Not only did she learn um, how to pronounce all of these things in two different, very different languages, she then had to narrate them from a child's point of view with a child's voice, um, a middle-aged man's voice, an older woman's voice. So she was having to bring in that as well. And it's amazing. Now, Janae, as a former professor, you are committed to education, obviously, especially the education of women and girls. How does that commitment feature in the second book of the series, Double Exposure? In Double Exposure, Annie, um, for risk of a spoiler, returns to Afghanistan with money raised by her daughter and some friends to help rebuild the school. And when she gets there, she discovers that there are people who don't want the school rebuilt. And that, I think, is reflective of what had been going on in Afghanistan even before the Taliban um, took over the country again on August 15th, 2021. And there is a real divide whether or not um, women and girls should have any education or should be educated beyond the age of 11. And um, in Pashtun tribal regions, um, there are still areas where women and girls are considered to be dishonoring their family and their tribe if they know how to read or write. Um, especially if they write anything creative, like poetry, which is a women's tradition 
in Afghanistan. I am deeply committed to the education of women and girls. And as you said in your introduction, whenever I go on a photo shoot, I always make it a point to visit schools, um, to take in um, donations of supplies. It was Nelson Mandela who said, and I'm paraphrasing, education is the single most powerful weapon that we have to bring about world peace. More or less, he said that. And I truly believe that. And Annie's best friend, Daria Faludi, who had emigrated to the U.S., returned to Afghanistan in Behind the Lens because she believed that the only way to bring Afghanistan into the 21st century was to create change from the inside. And that's why she founds a, um, a school for girls. After the age of 11, even before the Taliban took control again and outlawed education again for girls, um, girls and boys after a certain age had to be educated separately. In, in reading and preparing for Behind the Lens and, of course, the double exposure coming up, I was so struck, aside from it being just a great story, very well written, it's an excellent story. I mean, it really grabs you and it keeps your attention and, and you feel all these things for all these characters. But in addition to that, the level of research and the education for the, the reader or the listener that Janae has provided, it's I really had moments in the studio where I was just struck by some of the challenges that women and girls have to deal with and learning all the cultural bits about writing poetry and and the reasons things are, are done. And it, it's just, I think that the book, aside from just being a fantastic novel, is world-changing in a way. I mean, the reader can't help but be affected by the issues going on there with regards to women and girls and education. And I think that it's notable and very admirable for Janae to put that out in the world for for people who don't know and people who think they know but don't really know. That's so kind. Thank you. Uh, Janae, like your main character, Annie Hawkins, you're a photojournalist. How much is Annie Hawkins you? Well, she has red hair and I have red hair. She's a photographer and I'm a photographer. So... There are those two things. She travels the world, I travel the world, but she is very different from me in some ways. She's a war photographer. I am not. That's really dangerous. I have encountered enough dangers in my own photo shoots, and I'm glad I have. Um, I was in Namibia, and the lodge I was staying in burned down around me. And so at 3 a.m., I was grabbing my camera gear and leaping off of a, um, a balcony. Um, I was in far western Mongolia, and we had to do an eight-hour mad dash drive, not on roads, through a blizzard to get to an open airport because I was due at the next stage of the photo shoot. So even though I don't have the same experiences of being shot at, although I was shot at one time in um, Honduras. She says casually. <laughs> <laughs> like, you're Indiana Jones. You know? Yeah. I collect, Except cooler. <laughs> I collect experiences. And then what I try to do is channel the emotion, the adrenaline, the fear, the elation at having gotten out of a dangerous experience. And um, I can tap those as I create Annie's experiences. And this no these novels are all written from first person. So you are always in Annie's head. And sometimes that's a fairly dark, scary place to be. But you really need to um, feel that she's having these authentic responses to these situations where she's being shot at. So I'm able to tap into that, thankfully. And Annie has a teenage daughter. Um, I don't have any children, uh, much less teenage daughters. So um, I really had to punt on that. I tapped into 
um, the teenage daughters of friends. And she's a, a very different person than I am. Well, you certainly did a great job of bringing her to life regardless. <laughs> Thank you for that. The final question before our round of bonus questions, I should say. This goes to both of you in different ways. I'll start with Nicole. Uh, Nicole, what do you find easiest about the narrating process and what do you find the most difficult? Well, I guess the easiest thing for me is I've always been an actor. I mean, I've I've been on stage since I was 10. And before that, I was doing concerts and plays in my living room from, I mean, you know, since I can remember. So um, I like playing all the parts. I like the character development, and I like I like learning about the characters. So that's all pretty easy. Um, the most difficult thing uh, or most challenging is sometimes when I have a really tough accent or, you know, that can be challenging, but I enjoy it, probably working around my family, and I'm still not a full-time narrator, so I have to balance, you know, the other job and, and narrating, which is you know, really that just being able to focus on just narration is probably the hardest for me. For Janae, in writing, what do you find the easiest and most, most difficult about that process? The easiest thing for me is once I get into writing mode, <clears throat> the rest of the world just sloughs away. And I will often write for 16 to 20 hours a day. Um, and then my characters follow me into the shower which having Sorelli follow you into the shower is not necessarily a bad thing. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> like, I got a little blushy in the booth, by the way. <laughs> <A couple of things. laughs> uh, so writing comes fairly um, easy to me when I'm in writing mode. Waiting for writing mode to occur. I am not a disciplined writer in that um, although I touch my writing every day in some way, shape, or form, I do not um, deal with prompts. I do not sit down like Stephen King does every day to write his 10 pages. I wait for writing mode to occur. And um, the other thing that can be challenging for me is research. And researching the world I want to create so that it feels authentic, it feels like an organic part of the novel, that it's not an information dump, and that everything, every piece of research um, feels like it's um, an integral part of the different characters and being revealed by them, or it's an organic part of the story. And um, that's one of the things that I love the best is playing with that and making wonderful discoveries while I'm researching. Right. Okay. Uh, I'm going to have Sarah kick us off on the bonus round. You can just answer with the first thing that comes to your mind. Buckle up, listeners. It's time for Hot Six. Uh. Question one. What is the most overrated book you've read? Fifty Shades of Grey. Oh, there you go. I could agree with you on that. Question two. What famous literary work have you never read but feel like you should have? James Joyce's Finnegan's Wake. Oh, I have to come up with something. Moby Dick. If you could be any animal for one day, what would you be? I think I'd be a big cat somewhere like in the big, jungle. Being like a big, like, okay, jungle cat. Yeah, like a, uh, yeah, like a panther or something. Uh, given that I'm about to go on a photo shoot for big cats and wild dogs in Zimbabwe and South Africa, I would definitely say a big cat. And I'm thinking a cheetah. But I also love lemurs. I mean, can you just imagine swinging through trees like that? I love lemurs. I also love elephants. Elephants are amazing. I, I like elephants. What is your biggest grammatical pet peeve? I think probably the your and your, you know, the contraction or the, that's kind of a trendy pet peeve to have with grammar, but it's, it's true. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what about you, Janae? Do you have one that sticks in your craw more, more than others? I am a former English professor. <laughs> like all of them. <laughs> I have so many. Let out the pet peeves. Um, 
probably dangling modifiers. Looking back over your entire lifetime, what is your most embarrassing favorite song? Something by Neil Diamond. That works. The whole catalog. The whole thing. <laughs> I mean, really, it's all the same, but... <laughs> what about you, is there something on your playlist that you would want anybody to know? Probably my entire playlist. Oh. Um, I don't know. I, I tend to, when I love music, some musical piece, I own it. And so lots of people will tell me, are you kidding? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I love it. <laughs> No shame. I love it. <laughs> Very cool. All right. That ends all the questions we have. Thank you both so much for being here. I really appreciate your time. Oh, this is great. Yeah, it was delightful to meet you both. It was wonderful being here, meeting all of you, and finally seeing Nicole. Yes, agreed, agreed. This has been wonderful. What a great part of my day. You've been listening to Flock Talk, 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 the podcast where we feature your favorite authors and narrators. Hosted by Craig Hart and Sarah Hannon. This podcast is produced by Pink Flamingo Productions. Pink Flamingo Productions. Editing by Craig Hart. Visit us today at pinkflamingoproductions.com. Pink Flamingo Productions.